apparently a new vulnerability in ping dropped. And ping is an interesting utility because it's a set UID binary because it requires access to raw packets. So usually regular users can execute it. So a vulnerability in ping that could maybe be ele elevated uh, to root is very interesting. And especially ping is also such a basic utility. We all think that, you know, finding an overflow in there is kind of interesting and unique. And so let's explore uh, the, the advisory and see, and see if we can make sense of it. Stack overflow in ping. Um, this is from the FreeBSD project. It may be possible for a malicious host to trigger remote code execution in ping. So if your ping version is vulnerable, theoretically, or what we always should assume with a memory corruption, that there might be a way that that could be turned into code execution. So you use the ping utility to ping a malicious host and that host sends back responds back with um, malicious packets leading to, you know, a code execution. Ping reads raw IP packets from the network to process responses in the PR pack function. As part of the processing, a response ping has re has to reconstruct the IP header, the ICMP header, and if present, a quoted packet, which represents the packet that generated an ICMP error. The PR pack copies received IP and ICMP headers into a stack buffer for further processing. In so doing, it fails to take into account the possible presence of IP option headers following the IP header in either the response or the quoted packet. When IP options are present, PR pack overflows the destination buffer by up to 40 bytes. The impact, the memory safety bugs described above can be triggered by a remote host causing the ping program to crash. It may be possible for a malicious host to trigger a remote code execution in ping. The ping process runs in a capability mode sandbox. Oh, oh, okay. On all affected versions of FreeB, oh, but only FreeBSD. And it is thus very constrained in how it can interact with the rest of the system at the point where the bug can occur. Okay, and now they list here some patches. We just briefly already looked at it. And you know what? I wanted to try out to take this and see if JetGPT can explain it to me so I don't have to think for myself. By the way, don't misunderstand my talking as explanations as if I'm saying here the correct things. I have not prepared a script here that I kind of like fact checked and stuff like, right? You observe me thinking out loud with, with assumptions that I speak out as if they are true and then later maybe I encounter stuff that validates these assumptions or disproves them, you know? Here is a patch file. Can you explain what was changed? And then we just give it the whole patch. Oh, and the question is, I guess also, this is a free BSD advisory. Does it also affect the other uh, distributions? Does anybody know? Does anybody have a few more links or references? BSD code bases are really divergent. I doubt it, but I have not looked. Yeah, okay. I, I'm really not familiar with like the family tree of stuff. I would have guessed that maybe ping is like so old that it might have been derived from like Unix times or something. And that's why it's kind of the same in all the different distributions. But maybe they also had rewrites over the time. I, I really have no clue. I wonder if somebody already started to scan the whole internet trying to find this vulnerability. It does not make sense to scan the internet for this because ping is like a client program that you use, right? Like you type into your terminal ping and then you ping um, a host. And that host can send back malicious responses and that could potentially exploit the ping funct uh, functionality. Um, Ping using ICMP and IP packets, I guess as a way maybe to spoof ping responses and you could like blindly just hope you, I, but I, I'm not familiar with the protocol itself. Um, if the, I assume also maybe there's like a sequence number or something that you would have to guess or something so to make that uh, impossible, I'm, I'm not sure. Either way, the way more realistic way of exploiting this is that you already have access to a system and you are the regular user and because ping is a usual uh, is a set UID binary that you can then run ping against your attack server and then it exploits ping and you get then uh, you elevate your privileges to uh, to root uh, that seems to be a lot more realistic like vector and then I guess maybe there are also utilities that just wrap around ping I don't know I could imagine that there are some 
fancy microservices that use ping to check if the target microservice host is up or something like this. I could imagine, I don't know. Uh, and then maybe that could also be interesting, but yeah. This patch file appears to be modifying the ping utility. The patch file used the diff format. Okay, we don't care about that. Can you explain uh, how the code was modified? I'm lazy. So let's see what JetGPT said about uh, this patch. The patch adds a check for zero byte reads from the receive from function and modifies how the IP header length is calculated. Here's a brief summary of the changes made by the patch. The patch file adds a check for zero byte reads from receive from. If ping receives a zero byte read, it will simply continue without issuing a warning. Doesn't seem to be critical. The patch file modifies how the IP header length is calculated. In the original file, the IP header length is calculated by taking the lower four bits of the first byte and shifting them to the left by two bits. The patch file changes this calculation to use the full first byte of the IP header, which contains the IP header length in four byte octet. The patch file also modifies how the quoted IP header and ICMP header are extracted from the received packet. In the original file, the quoted IP header and ICMP header are extracted by assuming a fixed size IP header and copying a fixed number of bytes into the corresponding structure. The patch file changes this to use the actual size of the IP header and ICMP header as calculated from the received packet. So this is the, how can we get a quick syntax highlighting of this? So here, here was a mem copy, which previously get the size of IP header of the received packet. The information is contained in the lower four bits of the first byte. So let's open Wikipedia IP header. I guess it's IPv4, right? So is that the size IHL internet header length? Okay, the IPv4 header is a variable size to the, to the optional field options. IHL field contains the size of the IPv4 header. It has four bits that specify the number of 32-bit words in the header. Wow, there can be quite a few. The minimum value for this field is five, which indicates a length of five times 32 bits which is 20 bytes. As a four bit field, the maximum value is 15. This means the, the maximum size of the IPv4 header is 60 bytes. Let's go back to the code. Before, so this seems logical, right? For now, we take the lower four bits of the first byte. And apparently it was this code here. It copies out, ah no, H, oh no, no, okay. Getting the length here is fine. They didn't change that. But before then, they just copied out Accord based on this length. And that apparently was wrong. So let's see what changed. Get size of IP header of the received packet. The header length is contained in the lower four bits of the first byte and represents the number of four byte octets the header takes up. The IHL minimum value is five and its maximum value is 15. We just read that on Wikipedia as well. Okay, now here, check the IP header and <laughs> they added here, reject the IP header with a short header. If the HLAN is smaller than the, the minimum, I guess, IP size, I guess this IP struct is probably the minimum size, which is basically this 20 bytes here, IHL too short, I can see that that could cause problems. If you assume by default, it, it's at always at least at size, but suddenly you receive an IP packet that is shorter than intended, I could see how that maybe could cause issues. And here they only copy out really the IP packet, ignoring actually the, the actual size, which means they don't care here about the options, which maybe makes sense. Maybe the for the ping command, these ICMP packets, you know that there are never any options anyway, so you basically just don't care about if, if somebody sends back uh, IP options, you really don't care about it. You really only care about the stuff before it, I guess. That's my assumption right now. Check packet has enough data to carry a valid ICMP header. So this code was there before. So if you read an ICE, uh, HLAN plus ICMP min length, and what is CC? Oh, that is how much was received, I guess, received LAN. Okay, so this change here. So we read some offset of, if we don't have enough bytes for a quoted IP header and an ICMP header, then stop. Maybe we should read up how a ping really works or how ICMP really works because I have actually no clue. So 
ICMP data raw length. So it compares here whether the length is smaller than the size of a complete IP packet and the size of a complete ICMP packet. And otherwise the quoted data was too short. So how is this length here calculated? It's, it's the receive length minus H length and H length is is, is, the, is the value that was read from the packet. Right now, is my imagination correct that basically the ping command or the response that here ping expects is IP header, ICMP header, quoted IP header. So you basically have the, the actual IP header that was responsible for getting the packet where it's supposed to go. And then we have a quoted, um, um, uh, then we have an ICMP packet or header and then we have a quoted IP header, which just a random guess might be the original IP header that was sent to that host maybe. So here we read the length of the actual like IP packet that got the packet as a response to ping. And then down here we calculate CC is the how many bytes were actually received right now. So all the raw data and we subtract from it the length of the original packet plus offset off. And now I clue what the offset off calculation now is. So we subtract here the length of the original packet plus the offset of struct ICMP. What does the offset off function do? Oh, offset off is actually a C macro. I didn't know that. It's used to calculate the offset of a field in a structure. Oh, see, I'm learning new stuff. Interesting. <laughs> I'm such a noob. You would, yeah, well, it's just a macro, right? So I look at this assembly, you don't see the macro there anymore. The ICMP, so we have the original IP header, which is HLAN, and then we have um, ICMP up until where the ICMP data starts, which I would assume is basically the whole ICMP packet or the header of the ICMP packet or however you want to call it. And uh, which makes sense. So, so, so ICMP data raw length is now really the total length that was received minus at the top the IP packet um, and then minus also the offset where the ICMP data starts. So this is actually like the ICMP raw data length uh, that's now there. Okay, makes total sense to me now. And then we check if that length even makes sense. If that contains, oh, there it appears to be there are four packets in total. Ah, it's not just a quoted IP header. It, that quoted IP header also contains an ICMP header. So we have the IP header, ICMP header, and with, and then we have another quoted IP header with its quoted ICMP header, which I assume this was the original ICMP packet that was sent to the host. That's just an assumption, but would make sense for like debugging or matching up purposes or so. You execute ping, you send out ICMP packets, the host takes it, takes your ICMP packet, creates a new ICMP packet and adds your ICMP packet, sends it back and that's the parsing code for it, right? Does that make, is that, is that correct? Um, so if we don't have enough bytes for a quoted IP header and an ICMP header, then we stop, all right. And here we remove this code and I guess replaced it with uh, this all validation here. Reject the IP packet with a short header. Check against the actual IP header length to protect against quoted packets carrying IP options. So the inner, the, the quoted IP header can also have options and that was not included. Let's look at the uh, original code. So originally there was no ICMP data raw length. There was just um, ICMP data raw, which was a pointer to kind of like the same, what is buff? Was this just renamed to CC? No, buff still exists. Buff is, what's the difference between buff and CC? Okay, buff, we assume it's also just the raw packet coming in. Maybe it's the same as CC, I could imagine um, the way how it's kind of all used here, but it's really confusing. In the patch patched code, what is CC and what is buff? CC is a variable of type int that re represents the number of bytes received in the packet from the receive from function. Buff is a variable of type uchar pointer that points to a buffer containing the received packet. Oh, buff is a pointer. CC is just a number of packets. 
Thank you, ChatGPT. Dude, I'm so addicted to ChatGPT. It's just so good. It, it's, it, it makes it really, like when I'm too lazy to figure something out, I just ask. And if it gets it correct, I'm happy. And if not, I can still look at the code and think about it myself. ICMP data raw is the pointer to where the ICMP data starts, which makes sense. We have the buffer plus the IP header length plus the offset inside the ICMP packet where the ICMP data starts, and that is the pointer. And additionally, we now also calculate the length, which we can do by getting the total amount of data received minus uh, the, the length plus the um, basically the, exactly the same thing. It's It's just, yeah. Now I get it. In the old code, it now performed a mem copy. Okay, first of all, it gets here the option. I is this the is this the quoted IP header? So what does it do? Okay, it does a mem copy for the option for the optional quoted. I don't know what OIP. Okay. What is OIP header length? Why is it called OIP header length? Original, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's likely that the variable OIP header length is named as such because it represents the length of the original IP header in the received packet. In this context, original likely refers to the IP header that was originally included in the packet that was sent by the remote host. This is, this is absolutely insane. I, I know it can make mistakes, right? I understand that there can be mistakes in there and we have experienced many mistakes that it does. This is like bouncing off ideas with a friend. Like imagine friend is sitting without next to you and you ask him, hey, yo, what do you think does the O in OIP header mean? And then your friend thinks, you know, may maybe it could be original or it could be offset, you know, like it's just bouncing ideas. And then you hear, listen to, to your friend saying it and then you think, yeah, that makes sense. Or no, I don't think so because of those reasons. That's like, it's just bouncing off ideas. It's like rubber duck debugging or so, you know, nobody, I, I, I don't want to claim that this is like the ground truth and we should just, you know, trust the opinions of this thing. But it's, if you use it as a tool and you understand the limitations and you learn how to interact with it, I'm so mind blown by it. It's so incredible. You have to push back. So you need some confidence against your friend because your friend is an ass and will be very, very adamant, adamant about uh, responses. So yeah, so original IP header length. Let's go back and see if that makes sense from the code. Uh, yeah, we have now the ICMP data raw. I forgot what is copying from what into what now. Look, I don't even have a shell quickly where, I, because I'm on Windows right now where I quickly can type in man. I just type in JetGPT. Just my friend knows it. Uh, okay, so copies f uh, destination here. Okay, so it copies from here. So it copies out, but then original IP, does not make sense, right? Because it starts copying out at the ICMP data where it starts. So it would be the quoted IP header. So or original IP header, I don't think makes sense. Maybe it's optional IP header because maybe that quoted IP packet is optional. I think the O in optional IP header length does not stand for original. Do you know what it stands for? It thinks based on the context that it stands for old or original as in the original IP header length. However, it also says in the patch file, the OIP header length is used to represent the length of the quoted IP header. And the quoted IP header is the original IP header. No, it made sense. It was right after all. The quoted IP header is the original IP header that was included in the echo request message sent by the ping utility. Maybe we, sh you know, I have uh, Photoshop open here. We, I could have drawn you this. So w because maybe it was like, it was clear in my mind, but when I tried to explain it, it was wrong. So when you send, uh, so you are here and here's your host B and you, s you, you send a ping then a ping is really also just um, an IP packet with ICMP as like the IP pa packet carries the ICMP data. And then my assumption was, which seems to solidify slowly, this host will respond back and it will respond back with an IP and ICMP, but then include the quoted IP ICMP and uh, these two are the same. 
So it takes it takes this and includes it as quoted IP. So this is the original IP and ICMP packet combination, which is included in the response. And now we are here, we are parsing this packet here. And in there, that's why we call it the original IP header, right? Does it, I think so. So now we copy yeah, that out. And OIP had a length. I wonder, uh, it, it did say earlier what it was, right? Was it just an integer? It's a U and 8. So it's the, it's, um, it only reads now one byte from the quoted IP header. So this is the original IP packet and it reads out the first byte. So it probably reads out here the version as well with the IHL. Here it also extracts now the, the IHL. Um, from the original IP header and then it just copied and then it trusted this length and it just mem copied from the received data into OIP and I guess OIP is not large enough. See if OIP, if ChatGPG can help us. What is OIP? The patch file OIP is a local variable used by the ping utility. It's a variable of type struct IP. Uh, can you show the struct IP definition? It has a certain size. So, so, so when, so when we do here, uh, size of struct IP, what do we get? The problem is the IP packet can have variable length as we just learned because of the options, which means if you get the size of from that struct, it will not account for obviously optional options. It will probably be just this size without options. Okay, apparently it's 20 bytes. So yeah, before it, it just copied, it trusted the length and copied it out into OIP. And OIP just has a size of 20 because it just looks like this and it started copying and there's no space for it for the options because it's just the IP header. It's not the optional IP options. So it started copying it into this in, into this data structure, but copying past it. Yeah. So so here I assume this is the vulnerable vulnerable line because uh, it just trusted the header length and just copied it because you didn't account for a possible larger length. And uh, now this code that they added, they now check if it's shorter, which is fine. But mo much more important is this check here. This is just, I guess, a nice to have. But more important is, I guess, this check here because it uh, checks if um, the header length that you just read out plus the size of the ICMP packet is larger than the actual data that was received. And if that's larger, you try to copy more data than, than you actually read. No, wait, uh, wait, I'm, it was wrong. I, I think it was wrong what, what I just said. Ah, okay. No, it, it's fine. Yeah, I thought this is the important check, but it's not the important check. So here now they just make sure that uh, the header length that you read from the quoted packet plus the the size of the ICMP packet itself, or it's not larger than all the data you receive. So that just that value makes sense and fits into the data that you that was received. And then comes the mem copy and here's the patch. This is the important part, the size of before that it just trusted the length from the packet. But now it really just copies the size of um, of the struct. Now it doesn't copy more, it just copies the size of the struct IP into uh, here. And, and that's the safe way to do it, which I think is a very interesting anti pattern, right? You knew you have a certain struct. And instead of just copying that struct size into here, you trusted the length of the packet. That's a really bad anti pattern, which is interesting maybe to, you know, if you could operate CodeQL, like I don't, I cannot use CodeQL to look for co sources where this is dynamically, where, where if you have a struct, a well-defined struct here, but you have a variable here, that is a, may, might be a bad pattern because you see the fix here, the size of the struct, you expect this data to match. And if it's large enough, like it's not like you read past this, like you read enough data to cover the size of the IP packet, then just copy only the size of the IP packet and not more. Yeah, 
and then uh, we update here the pointer. We uh, now have, um, we add the IP header length. Now we move the pointer forward and now we are, so uh, basically if we go back to our um, thing, we were here and we copied now the IP packet and now we move the pointer forward to here and now we point to the quoted ICMP packet, original ICMP packet raw. And before that, we also just had a mem copy here where it would copy from that pointer into the original ICMP struct. And how much do we copy? We, yeah, I don't know, that's like a calculator. That, that, that seems weird. Yeah, why not? If you know this is a struct ICMP, why was this like this weird calculation here? just copy the struct of the ICMP. I don't quite understand why they did that. Let's ask JetGPT. In the original code, they did this, mem copy with this weird offset uh, calculation. Uh, why did they calculate the size this way and not just use size of struct ICMP? The code you have provided uses the offset and size of operators to calculate the size of a struct ICMP instance in a specific way. The offset of operators used to determine the offset of a field within a struct and the size of operators used to determine the size of a data type or variable in bytes. In this case, the, in this case, the code is using offset struct ICMP ICMP ID to determine the offset of the ICMP ID field within the struct ICMP. Can you show the struct ICMP definition? Okay, so the ICMP ID, where is that? Wait, ICMP, I'm too dumb to understand this. Ah, uh, that, that's ICMP hun here. So it's that struct and it's it points to here in this union. Why? It's so weird that it's calculated this way. To calculate the total size of the struct ICMP instance. Ah, because I guess they expect a certain type of ICMP packet, maybe. And they knew that it would only be, or they only needed it up until this point and didn't want to copy potentially the whole thing or something like that. If the code was only interested in copying the entire struct ICMP type, then it could simply use size of struct to determine the size. So is this an optimization that they tried to like only copy as much as they needed and had this weird calculation here? Yeah, they didn't really care about the whole ICMP packet. They Now I get it. They just copy from, no. Yeah, they, they copy up in, and including the ICMP ID only up until there. Is that just a small optimization? That's why they did that? Anyway, I guess this is much cleaner code and uh, just copy out the whole one. I guess these couple of copy, like these couple of bytes more don't make a difference. Anyway, I think we kind of get uh, like, uh, I feel like I got, I understand it now. Should we summarize what I understood what, what's happening? So you are here and here is the server and you execute a ping. And a ping is really just, it's an IP packet. And that IP packet carries an ICMP packet. And then the server responds back to that ping, also sending you back an IP packet with ICMP. But apparently, as we just learned, it carries a quoted IP packet with an ICMP packet, which I assume is just the original IP ICMP packet. I mean, it's it's not that important. You know, maybe maybe this is not how, how the protocol works, okay? This is just what I really just derived from reading over the code. So, uh, so B takes this and adds it on top of it and we respond it. But here's, but this is where, 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 the, where the bug happens. Uh, the bug happens because IP packets can have options and they read this they, they, they consume this, it's all good, and then they come here, and here they read out the IP header length, and then they copy that IP header length into a buffer, uh, and usually this IP header length basically covers uh, this packet here, and they copy it out um, into a struct that is only the size of this IP packet. Problem is, and this is where a malicious uh, server comes into play. The IP packet can be optional options. And when you now copy this whole thing into your small 
local variable, then you overflow here. And um, we learned that the, the options, uh, like the total size of an IP packet can be 60 bytes. The minimum size is 20 bytes, which makes it, there can be 40 bytes of optional options. And these are exactly the 40 bytes that are then overflown on the stack. And if we come back to the original advisory, now everything makes sense what they write here. It copies the received IP and ICMP headers into a stack buffer for further processing. In so doing so, it fails to take into account the possible presence of IP option headers following the IP header in either the response or the quoted packet. Oh, it can already happen in here. Um, I, I guess because PR pack is called on, uh, okay, whatever, small detail. In the end, it, what, what really matters is that when, when the IP options are present and the IP header length is the maximum size, it will just copy up to 40 more bytes, which there is no space here on the stack. So now I feel like we understand uh, what the bug was and how it works. Now I wonder about exploitability. In the original advisory, they already wrote that ping runs in a capability mode sandbox on all affected versions. It's just very constrained. Has somebody implemented already a remote code execution? Like, is it actually like exploitable? Ping ru can run and listen and receive multiple packets, right? So there might be a way Especially if you have control over the ping utility, you, you could keep running it. If it's set UID, you cannot inspect the proc maps to get like an ASLR leak, right? You don't have access to that, or do you? Can I read the proc hit maps file of a set UID process as, a, as an unprivileged user? No, an unprivileged... See, the, the, the cool thing is, what Geek at Work would did, like, you know, usually when I have a question like this, I'm not so sure about, I have an assumption, but I want to show I verify it. I, I have to pull up like a terminal, you know, like I have, uh, connect to a server of my running Linux or something and quickly test it. And I can quickly test it, it's fine. But I can also be lazy and just literally write into JetGPT, can I read proc pit maps file of a ZUID process as an unprivileged user? And it tells me, no, an unprivileged user cannot read the proc pit maps file of a ZUID process. Do you believe in it though? Well, again, it can make mistakes. As I mentioned earlier, it's like you bounce ideas off a friend. Uh, um, and especially if it matches like my expectation, you know, I, I ha of course I haven't proved it, but you know, I don't know, it's, I still think it's a great tool that can help me. What are the capabilities of ping running on FreeBSD? The thing is, I don't even have a FreeBSD system. You know how much time it would take me now to like download an image, set it up in um, VMware? It would literally take me like 10 minutes or so. But I can also just ask JetGPT about what are the capabilities and it would just tell me might have misunderstood what I meant with capabilities. Um, what are the permissions and security capabilities? See, here we get the capabilities. On FreeBSD, ping is typically installed as set UID root, which means that it runs with the permission of the root user. This allows ping to access privileged system resources and perform network related tasks that require elevated privileges. In terms of security capabilities, ping on FreeBSD is typically compiled with the net capnet capability capability net for network for raw network access and uh, admin network. I don't know exactly what that is. These capabilities allow ping to perform low level network operations such as sending and receiving raw IP packets and to configure network interfaces and routing tables. Overall, the permissions and security capabilities of ping on FreeBSD allow it to perform tasks it is designed for. I'm not familiar with FreeBSD and how that all works. And when they say it's running in a capability mode sandbox, does it mean I cannot, for example, ping is not allowed to do like exec, exec or open or something. So all it can do is basically like open socket and do read and write on, on, on a socket and something. Is that like the what, what, how we should understand that? However, con having control over the network, I don't have an idea on top of my head, but probably there are some interesting ways how you could turn that into 
uh, remote code, uh, like into a privilege escalation as well, because you could probably reroute traffic. If it allows you to configure network interfaces, then you could change like routing information, I don't know. And then you could man in the middle, you get could turn it into a man in the middle setup. And then, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there could be interesting ways maybe to pull it off. What is the capability sa sandbox in FreeBSD? The capability sandbox in FreeBSD is a security feature that allows users to execute programs with a reduced set of permissions and capabilities. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Using Capsium framework, which provides a set of APIs and tools for creating and managing capability based sandboxes. Using the Capsium framework, developers can create sandbox programs that run with a reduced set of permissions. A uh, program running on FreeBSD with the CapNet Raw and CapNet Admin capability sandbox. Uh, what what can it do and what can it not do? A program running on FreeBSD with the CapNet Raw and CapNet Admin capability sandbox can perform low level network operations such as sending and receiving raw IP packets and can configure network interfaces and routing tables. This allows the program to implement a wide range of network related functionality. However, a program running on FreeBSD uh, cannot access sensitive system resources for performing actions that could compromise the security of the system. Well, I'm questioning that because being able to change network interfaces and routing tables, that does sound like it's compromising the security of the system, but yeah. For example, the program cannot read or write to arbitrary files on the file system, cannot create or modify system processes, and cannot access the system's kernel or kernel data structures. Overall, the CapNet Raw and CapNet Admin capability sandbox allow the program to perform a specific set of network related tasks while also limiting its access to sensitive system resources. Okay, kind of like what, what I assumed and I just trust it to be right. I feel like we understood uh, Ping now. Long story short, and JetGPT helped us understand this vulnerability. It was kind of insane to use JetGPT for that. Um, I also still wonder um, if it like affects Ubuntu, but somebody else said that it doesn't affect, uh, that it only affects FreeBSD, right? Um, yeah, I'm really curious to see if somebody uh, figures out uh, a proof of concept attack for this. It, it seems pretty likely, 14, 40 bytes over the, the stack. Um, I mean, stack canaries and everything and ASLR might be challenging, but because you can instruct ping to send multiple packets, there might be and of course you control the binary, right? In this threat model of privilege escalation, you control the binary. So uh, it might be quite interesting um, what you might be able to achieve. Like if, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, thanks whoever shared this link earlier because you completely nerd sniped me with this now for like one and a half hours or so. We are done with this now, was interesting. We used JetGPT again uh, and Let's go back to something relaxing, okay? We have heard enough. Somebody who has no experience about AI to, to talk about AI. I, I feel like I'm like a crypto bro talking about financial uh, systems or something like this. That's how I feel right now. Like I should stop talking right now because I'm probably sounding, or I sound like somebody who has no clue about hacking talk about hacking. As a simple hacking content creator, I'm not able to answer questions about large language models like JetGPT. It's banned and you will be banned if you keep talking about it.